Job chapter 38, be reading from verses 1 to 21. Hear the word of the Lord. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge, dressed for action like a man? I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it? And set bars and doors and said, thus far shall you come and no farther. And here shall you, your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like the clay under the seal and its features stand out like a garment from the wicked. Their light is withheld and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare it if you know all this. Where is the way to the dwelling of light? And where is the place of darkness that you may take it into my, into, may take it to its territory? And that you may discern the paths of its home. You know, for you were born then, and the number of your days is great. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his holy word. That's really just a sampling of how the Lord begins to question him. Why do bad things happen to good people? That's considered one of the most weighty, most philosophically difficult questions of all time, especially for those who believe in God. In the spring of 1986, my, when I was a junior in college, my father was sent to the Mayo Clinic for treatment for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and was told there bluntly that he had three months to live. That proved accurate. Uh, he made his living on the business side of health care as a hospital administrator, but even he thought it was jarring to be told so coldly that that's all the time he had left. He had an old college friend who had become a pastor in the Rochester, Minnesota area and so visited him while he was in the Mayo Clinic. Now, part of what he said to my father was about this problem. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do some of the best people get cancer at the age of 47 and die? He related to my father that this is the the problem of evil. There is evil in the world and it strikes good people. Why? Can God not stop it? Or does he not care? God, by definition, is supposed to be all-powerful, omnipotent, and loving. God is love. But then there is evil. Bad things happen to good people. So how can that be? Either God isn't all-powerful, that is, he wants to stop bad things to good people, but he can't. Something is more powerful than him preventing him from stopping the evil. Or maybe it's our free will. That's what a lot of modern theology says, our free will. It prevents him from doing what he wants to do. But since there is evil in the world and God hasn't stopped it, then either logically he can't or he won't. Is he either not able or is he not good? What's the answer to that? The old friend, now a pastor, uh, told my father that it was a mystery. We just have to trust God. It's a mystery. And apparently his demeanor was comforting because he left a good impression on my father. He was not a miserable comforter. That's the problem of evil. And it goes back at least as far as the Greek philosopher Epicurus, who lived in the 4th century BC. Epicurus reasoned that if God cares about our suffering, all loving, and can stop our suffering, all powerful, then logically there shouldn't be any suffering. So since there is still suffering, either God is not all powerful or he's not good. This argument is used by atheists to say, see, there cannot be a God. It is often answered by Christians like that pastor by saying it's a mystery. So why do bad things happen to good people? I saw a prominent Christian professor of philosophy musing about this on Facebook 
once, and I responded, simply said back, isn't that what the book of Job is about? His response was even more simple. No. Well, I thought, well, why not? It's about God. It's about suffering. So surely it's relevant to why bad things happen to good people. But he wanted to rely on some kind of a free will argument. That is, God has left us up to our free will, and so we get bad things because of, of our free will. And that just, of course, that kind of argument doesn't find any place in the book of Job. Except perhaps in the way the three friends assume that Job is suffering due to his free will, supposedly choosing to sin. But the book, book of Job doesn't make that argument look very good. So oddly enough, our situation today is that we have a lot of people who want to debate the problem of evil, but they don't often like to turn to the book of Job for the answer. Why do bad things happen to good people? Well, let's turn to the book of Job. Does it answer the question? Well, we'll see in three parts. First, the doubts. Second, the unanswered question. And last, the problem. First, there's the doubts. Why do bad things happen to good people? Last week, we saw one of the answers, partial answer to that question, when Elihu says in chapter 36, verse 15, remember, that God delivers the afflicted by their affliction and opens their ear by adversity. What C.S. Lewis described as suffering being God's megaphone to rouse a, a deaf world. But what is God delivering the afflicted from by their affliction? Well, from their not knowing God. But the scoffer will respond to that with an incredulous question. You know, you're telling me that God is allowing suffering. He's loosing viruses that cause millions of deaths, tsunamis that wash people away, cancer that takes people in the prime of life, freak accidents, vicious criminals, murderous invaders, all kinds of evil. And it's all just so we'll seek God, seek God, seek to know him. They'll say that that God is a megalomaniac. He's a narcissist. He's a sadist to afflict people just to get their attention. He should exist. They say he should exist to make me happy. So people now insist with no sense of irony. He's self-centered because he's not centered on me. The more the affliction, the more we should be angry and bitter at him. Modern coddled people think. In the hit Broadway play, The Book of Mormon, one of the key songs, uh, the title of which is so obscene, I can't repeat it, assumes that the poor, afflicted, ravages, ravaged African people that these Mormon missionaries are going to, they simply, because they have such a hard life, the assumption is they simply must be so angry at God that they regularly curse him. Well, like Job's wife, the advice of modern culture to believers is, Curse God and die. We should doubt a God like that, they say. But in reality, it is often that destitute, desperate places like Ethiopia have the most reverence for God. It's as if Elihu was right. Through adversity, God opens our ears. Or well, the smug who think that you know, they're God's best buds, who think that they have no doubts, Think that they know God well enough already. They don't need affliction to know God, they think. But that kind of knowledge of God is something that we'll have to wait until we see him face to face. Paul told the Corinthians in that magnificent chapter on love that for now we see in a mirror dimly, a glass darkly. But then, face to face, now I know in part, then I shall know, I shall fully, even as I have been fully known. Well, the book of Job tells us how to live while we're seeing through a glass darkly. What we need now, peering through a murky window, are doubts. Not doubt about God, but we do need doubts. Affliction comes to make us doubt the things that we should be doubting, to trust them less. So you think you think money will solve all your problems? Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, had $7 billion, and it did him no good against pancreatic cancer. His riches couldn't buy him a cure that medicine didn't have. He died at my age. You think his family? That's the answer to everything. Well, what if you're like Job and the only member of your family left 
is scorning you. A lot of people, like Job throughout this book, are not doubting the right things. The key sentence for unlocking the whole book of Job, I think, is that incredibly subversive question that God first asked Job, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? That question is really the climax of this whole drama. It settles everything. It doesn't answer the questions, but it settles them. Job's friends felt they knew God well enough. And they knew enough about God to, to predict how he will always behave. Job thought he was important enough to demand that God answer his, his protest. Neither doubted themselves. People, off, people who ask, why do bad things happen to good people? Always assume that they are one of those good people. And God's question to us all is, where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Uh, nowhere. And what does that tell us about ourselves before God? Yeah, I guess I'm the creature. God is the creator. Well, that's a big difference, isn't it? Yes, a very big difference. Both Job and his friends forgot that. That subversive question is meant to cause us doubts. Job, like a lot of good people who suffer bad things, wrestles with doubts about God. Not that he exists, but whether he's good or not. Some scholars even thought, uh, even think that that great statement of faith in Job chapter 13, verse 15, often, often quoted, you know, though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. That it should be read as a sarcastic question. Though he slay me? You expect me to hope in him? Probably not. That's probably not right. But Job says immediately after that, I will argue my ways to his face. He's confident. Notice what Job is not doubting at that moment. He's confident that if he could argue directly with God, that he, Job, can win that argument. He can convince God himself that God was wrong to allow these bad things to ha happen to such a good person. He doesn't doubt his capacity to question God, but he does doubt God's goodness. Like Epicurus, God is all powerful, but doesn't stop suffering. He must not be good. He complains in chapter 19, verse 11, he has kindled his wrath against me and counts me as his adversary. After chapters of that kind of confidence, then come, comes God's sub subversive question. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? It's meant to reverberate through our souls until we finally get it. God is God and we're not. God then asks question after question, each one designed to put the doubter in his place. Did you notice the sarcasm in chapter 38, verse 21, the, the last verse where we stopped? You know, God says, you know, surely you can answer all these questions. For you were born then when the earth was founded, weren't you? And the number of your days is so great, Job. Ouch. Sarcasm is meant to humiliate. And here God is humiliating the one who doubts the wrong thing. Job doubted God's goodness. Worse than that, though, were the friends. They didn't doubt God's goodness because they didn't doubt themselves. They had too much faith in themselves and too little real knowledge of God. God deals with them at the end by making Job their intercessor. He, says, he tells them, you want to be right with me? You go to Job and make him, get him to intercede for you. What all these people have in common is that they don't doubt themselves. Job doesn't doubt his ability to prove himself right before God. Job's friends doubt Job because they don't doubt their mastery of God. What they all need, what God's four chapters of unrelenting questions are meant to create, are doubts. G.K. Chesterton said that the best approach to doubters is to be like God in the book of Job. Keep asking them questions to destroy their faith in themselves. Quote, in dealing with the arrogant assertor of doubt, it is not the right method to tell him to stop doubting. It's rather the right method to tell him to go on doubting, to doubt a little more, to doubt every day newer and wilder things in the universe until at last by some strange enlightenment, he may begin to doubt himself. 
The problem with the modern doubter of God is not that he has doubts, but that he doubts the wrong thing. He would be much better off uh, to doubt himself rather than God. That's what God, God's question, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation, is meant to create doubts about ourselves. There's a crisis right now in the, in the charismatic movement because many of the so-called prophets last year, and some up even until early this year and into, into January, claimed that God had told them that President Trump would be reelected. They claimed it with certainty. They said that God told them that Trump would continue as president in his, into a second term. Now, it wasn't good enough for them to say that that was the result of the election that they, they wanted, that was their preference, or that they, they felt he would win, that they prophesy in part. And here's what they think, maybe seeing the future through a dark glass, hearing God's voice imperfectly. Now that sounds, that sounds too weak. They spoke for God and said Trump will definitely continue in office. What they needed was a healthy dose of doubt. Not doubt of God, but doubt of themselves. Let that question sink in. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Let it sink in and shape your character. The modern approach, like that professor I encountered over Facebook, is to say instead, up, say up front, don't doubt God, but don't doubt him because he's not really responsible. He, he didn't do it. For whatever reason, usually because they say he's, he's bound himself to honor our free will. God can't stop the bad things happening to good people. Now, ultimately, I think that creates doubts about God because people think, well, that's the case. What good is he? He can't protect me from the bad things. But that way, they can kind of theoretically say that God is all-powerful and good, but still these bad things happen for, for some reason that doesn't allow him to use his power to stop them. The problem with that is that throughout the book of Job, God says that he is responsible. In the prologue in chapter 2, the Lord said, said to Satan, you, Satan, incited me, that's God speaking, you incited me against him, against Job, to ruin him. He, he's saying, clearly, God's saying that he did it. In the epilogue in chapter 42, verse 11, Job's brothers and sisters come to comfort him, and the writer says, the inspired writer says, for all, they're comforting him for all the evil, all the bad things that the Lord had brought upon him, according to the inspired author. And so the Holy Spirit, the Lord is responsible for the bad things that happened to Job. The law was given to show us our sin, to show us how sinful we are. We have this law to see therein that we are not free from sin. It's to make us doubt our self-righteousness. In the same way the book of Job is supposed to inspire in us doubt. Doubt of ourselves. And leave us content with that doubt. Trusting God instead of ourselves. Why do bad things happen to good people? Answer the question. We demand an answer. It's just that attitude that the book of Job was inspired by God to crush, to make us content with an unanswered question. Some say the book of Job tells us why Job suffered, that the first two chapters answer the question, but that's not really true. The first two chapters don't really tell us why Job suffered, only that God was in control of it all. But why did God do it? We don't really know, do we? It's the unanswered question. It's driving Job almost crazy through the whole book. And in chapter six, verse one, oh, that my vexation were weighed and all my calamity laid in the balances. Elihu chides him in chapter 33, verse 10. Why do you contend against him, against God, saying he will answer none of man's words? Job demands that God answers his questions in those long chapters of his angry, sullen debate. And then God speaks out of the storm and instead of answering Job, you know, why? Instead, he questions Job. So finally, Job, crushed by all those questions, admits in chapter 42, I know that you can do all things, all powerful, omnipotent, 
and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. He's free. Our free will doesn't stop his plan. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge, recalling God's question to him when God began to question him? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you will make it known to me what God had said to him earlier. I heard you of the uh, I heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Now, no longer, at least not as much, through a glass darkly. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. If that's the conclusion of a righteous of a righteous man whom the Lord singled out of the whole earth. There's no one like him. That's the conclusion from him. Then how much more ought it to be our conclusion? Content with an unanswered question. So the answer to the question of why bad things to happen to good people is frankly, it's none of your business. Our business is to trust him. The immediate, ob the immediate objection to that is, well, that's not a satisfactory answer. And that's just the point. Who do we think we are to demand answers to our satisfaction from God? We're supposed to trust him with unanswered questions. Well, some think the answer, well, is, is for our character. And sometimes that may be true, as we saw in 1 Peter, where we suffer, we're afflicted for our for our character, for our building up, for our discipline. But if we think all suffering in the world is just for our self-improvement, our character is awfully self-centered. I have an aunt and uncle who lived in, on a farm in eastern Arkansas. They were in their mid-30s with two boys, my cousins. And my uncle was a good family man. I remember him once when I was a kid taking us to a playground and spinning us around on a merry-go-round. One day he was working on his car in the barn by himself. And the car was on a jack and he forgot to put a block underneath it. And he went under the car and the car fell on him. He, he died there, crushed to death by the car. It was a terrible tragedy for my aunt and my two cousins. One I don't think they ever really fully recovered from. But as a result of that tragedy, my aunt uh, sought God, became a sincere Christian. And that's a good thing. But I remember her saying that perhaps her husband died to bring her to God. We are to sympathize with that, but I think saying that kind of thing is a mistake. We should never think that we are so important, that we are so much in the center of the universe, that God is going to kill other people just to teach us lessons. It's a subtle form of arrogance to accept bad things from the hand of God just because we think that God must have done it to make me better. The whole universe exists for my self-improvement. We're, we're desperate for an answer, of course, when things like that happen. To, to, to know why did this horrible thing happen? Why was my husband crushed to death in a barn? It must mean something. And we assume, because of the kind of people we are, that it means something about us. Now, yes, God works all things for good. He brings good out of all things, even, the bad, even out of bad things for those who love him. But that doesn't mean that all things revolve around us. Sometimes the good he may work out of bad things is to show us, like Job, who we are before God. To teach us to stop demanding an answer to every question. To stop screaming, there must be something we can find now to explain this to my satisfaction about me. He might be working, bringing good out of bad things, to cure us of our assumption that all our questions must be answered now. That assumption still hasn't been humbled by that disturbing question. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? We haven't been shaken out of our self-centeredness by it, made content to live. For now, while we're looking at God through a dark glass with unanswered questions, Why do bad things happen to good people? That's the conventional question, the, the problem of evil, all the way back to Epicurus, still stumping theologians today. That problem of evil assumes 
that if we are good moral people, we have a right to be protected from suffering. It sees morality like paying a premium on an insurance policy. If you pay your premiums, you have a right to get the coverage of the policy. Our morality is like coins in a divide vending machine. They should earn us the, the thing we want. But of course we have a problem, the so-called problem of, e of evil. We admit that we're not always getting what we want. So we're asking why? Why is this God machine malfunctioning? Oh, we're free, we're told these days. We're free to choose to live as God orders if we want or choose not to. But once we do, once we make our choice, God then is not free to give us other than what we have paid for. Our life, we're told now, obligates God. So we think the problem then must be if we paid the we pay the premiums, we put the coins in the divine vending machine, the problem then, if we have evil, the problem must be with God. But it's fundamental in the book of Job that God is absolutely free. Remember Job's conclusion? No plan of yours can be thwarted. He can do whatever he wants to do. He's not a tame lion. Good, yes, but not tame. Why do bad things happen to good people? That's supposed to be a profound philosophical question, confounding the greatest minds for centuries. But a good philosophical argument is supposed to be free of unexamined assumptions. Every claim is proved. But there's a glaring assumption in that question. Why do bad things happen to good people? Epicurus and thousands of philosophers and theologians since have stumped themselves over that conundrum of how, if God is good, then he can allow good people to suffer. The problem of evil that that pastor of the Mayo Clinic discussed with my father after he had just been told that he only has three months to live. But the glaring assumption is obvious. Why do you think there are good people? Where, where do these good people come from that you're talking about? The Bible says none is righteous, no, not one. That all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Even from the book of Job, just the book of Job itself, we've seen that the best of men can easily fall into sin and have to confess, I despise myself and repent to dust and ashes. Sure, Job is called blameless and righteous at the first, but that doesn't mean sinless. It means that God doesn't blame him for his sins, that the blame has been taken away. He's blameless. Righteous means to be right with God. The sin that would have alienated him from God has been forgiven. So even Job is not sinless. So the question is, so the question, why do bad things happen to good people, is false in his premise. There are no good people. But still, why do bad things happen to a man who is blameless? Okay, we can say, like Elihu, is to open the ears of the afflicted, but it gets more complicated. If we think it was simply to purify Job, to expose a particular sin, the, the kind of judgment that you know, has begun at the house of God, we heard about from 1 Peter, to discipline and to train us. If that's all that we think it's about, well, we miss the point of the book of Job. It's like the disciples asking Jesus in John chapter 9 you know, about the man who was, who was blind from birth. Rabbi, master, who sinned? There's this man here. He's, he's a beggar. He's blind. He's been, he was born blind. This man or his parents, that he was born blind. Who sinned? Who's responsible for this? Somebody had to commit some sin, they assumed, to deserve the blindness, they thought. Which means behind that is the assumption the rest of us who aren't blind didn't commit that sin. And we're good people. The disciples in John chapter 9, like Job's friends, thought the bad things happened to people as punishment for specific sins. And that basically they deserve it. And if we don't get it, that means we don't deserve it because we're better. They had a problem when a baby was born afflicted. That's a big problem for their system. You know, how could a baby have sinned? So they guess maybe it's punishment for a sin the parents committed. And Jesus said, no, it wasn't for a specific sin. It's because of all of your sinfulness or depravity. When Pontius Pilate massacred some Galileans offering sacrifices, people thought that the Galileans must have committed a particular sin that deserved it. They got what they deserved. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 13, no, they weren't any more sinful than you. In other words, you would deserve the same thing. A tower in Jerusalem collapsed and crushed 18 people to death. And Jesus asked, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? Is that why bad things happen to them? 
Because they're worse? Because they're bad people? Worse than you? Jesus said, no, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise, in the same way, perish. In other words, you're as bad as they are. You aren't good people. The premise to the question is totally wrong. Bad things don't happen to good people because there aren't good people. They are sinners who deserve all the bad things that happen to them. But this is different now from Job's friends or even the disciples who thought people were being punished for specific acts. And the rest of us that don't get that punishment must be not committing them. Jesus say, is saying, you're all sinful and you all deserve the bad things. That means then that the really puzzling, brain racking question for the Christian, for us, the really one should be, should be stumping us. The question is not why do bad things happen to good people? It's not the so-called problem of evil. The problem, the really brain racking, confounding problem is the problem of good. Why do so many good things happen? To us bad people. The problem for us is not the problem of evil. Only self-centered people, so sinful, that we're just totally out of touch with how self-absorbed we are, how arrogant we are, how depraved we are. Only we would just assume that we're good. That the Almighty owes, owes us a comfortable life. The question is the problem of good. Why he's been so good to us. That's why the book of Job ends with this exorbitant display of God's goodness to Job. Healed, restored, wealthy again. All to amaze us with the problem of good. I should correct something I said earlier that it's not quite accurate. I said that there are no good people. In fact, there was one good person, only one truly good man. And something bad did happen to that one truly good person. Why did bad things happen to him, to Jesus, the good person? So that God could bring good things to the rest of us bad people. So the book of Job leads us to God by giving us both a glimpse of how majestic and all-powerful our God is and how small we are in his shadow. A God so great that he makes us doubt ourselves and amazes us at his goodness. Even when we suffer bad things, we ought to be grateful that such a majestic God has taken any notice of us at all, that he has done good things for us despite ourselves once we've seen how big and good god is and how small and depraved we are we can live content with unanswered questions and then then finally we are ready for a better glimpse a clearer look of him through that dark glass and we know that whatever we find when we see him face to face will not be tame, but he will be good. Let's come to him now.